Hi everyone, thanks for joining today's webinar, Solving the Mystery Behind Imaging a Mac Computer. My name is Julia O'Shea and I'm the Global Marketing Manager here at BlackBag. Before we kick things off today, there are a few things I'd like to review. We are recording this webinar, so we will share an on-demand version after the webinar is complete. If you have any questions, please submit them in the questions window and then we'll answer them throughout and in the Q&A at the end of the webinar. I'm excited to introduce our speakers today. We have Tim Thorne and Stephanie Thompson, who are both solu solutions engineers here at BlackBag. Tim completed 30 years of service with the Metropolitan Police in London, where prior to his role in digital forensics, he worked from New Scotland Yard in drugs, murder, and robbery investigations. He specialized in long-term covert internal corruption investigations and later became the anti-corruption command lab manager for network and digital forensic investigations. He went on to lead the New Scotland Yard Counterterrorism Unit, where he managed a team responsible for exploiting digital media associated with those engaged in acts of terrorism, both inside and outside of the UK. Stephanie has been a digital forensic analyst working with the federal government space for 15 years prior to coming to Black Bag. Her background is primarily counterterrorism and counterintelligence investigations, but she has also worked closely with federal law enforcement agencies on a routine basis. She holds a Bachelor of Science in Management Information Systems from George Mason University and a Master's of Forensic Science degree from George Washington University. Thank you for joining us today, everyone, and welcome Tim and Stephanie. Tim, if you're ready, I will hand it over to you now to get started. Great, thanks, Julie. Um, hi everyone, just a quick overview, let you know, and uh, well, firstly to thank you very much for uh, taking time out of your day to come and listen to us. Um, we've put some information here together, hopefully that will assist you with imaging Max. Uh, I feel the title perhaps is a little optimistic, as uh, I don't think anyone would like to say they've completely solved the mystery, but uh, hopefully we've got some good information coming up for you um to, to help you in your everyday uh, work with mac computers apple are pretty good at making products as, as we as we know they're uh, they're high quality pieces of kit generally um, but they're also very good at uh, creating challenges for us forensic people so it's been kind of interesting for us over the last 12 months to uh, speak with all of our customers and our students in classes and things and, and look at the areas that are causing them some of the biggest problems with Mac imaging and hopefully we might uh, answer many of those questions if we don't completely solve the mystery itself. First of all we need to look at what Macquisition is. Um, I, I'm quite sure a lot of the people that we're talking to right now have actually got their hands on this tool. Um, it is of course uh, a leader in uh, imaging of Macs and doing live triage work with Macs and uh, currently it's available in uh, 120 gigabytes and one terabyte versions which is which is handy now because the one terabyte version is pretty good tool to have uh, enabling you to image most of the Macs that you'll come across obviously there'll be the bigger ones some of the big fusion drive Macs that uh, you'll need some extra storage potentially but generally speaking, the one terabyte will, will cover you off through most situations. We have created a, a number of boot environments, which now means you'll be able to boot most Mac computers. And in fact, in the uh, almost four years I've been with BlackBag, I've yet to come across a customer who's not been able to boot a Mac uh, that was bootable using uh, Macquisition. Of course, we have full support for APFS. And since our 2019 R1 version, we have uh, been able to support the uh, Apple's T2 chip and more on that later. We collect live data and we uh, can do the, create a boot environment into which you can use Macquisition to image volumes from the device. One of the nice new features, which many of you probably benefited from already, is the fact that we built uh, Paragon drivers into Macquisition, because as I'm sure you know, natively Macs do not actually write to uh, NTFS. 
but with Paragon drivers on board, you can now do that when you're using Macquisition, both in the booted environment or while running it live. So let's talk uh, briefly about what, what happens with uh, why you want to get involved in logical collections. Um, and obviously the, at the scene of, the, of an investigation, you may want to or need to acquire data before shutting down uh, a Mac. And of course, with today's computers, this has become more and more relevant. Um, gone, unfortunately, are the days where you could walk into a room and pull the power cord from the back of a device and then um, in the comfort of your lab later, do all of your imaging and all of your analysis. Security on these devices now means that we do have to interact with them. And in particular, from a Mac perspective, the sorts of things that are going to be causing us problems are File Vault 2 enabled devices. And more recently than that, the T2 chip hardware encryption that uh, Mac introduced, Apple introduced. So another reason you might be restricted is you actually, in some jurisdictions, your authorization might entitle you to only deal with live collection of data. So there are often a, a variety of reasons why live acquisitions is an option for, for examiners, but increasingly, the main reason is this may well be your one and only opportunity to get to this data while that machine is on and while it's logged in. So what do we need to think about? Well, one of the first things when you're dealing with a live Mac is that collecting it from, uh, collecting data from a Mac can be very different to a Windows machine. And many people, uh, even in the forensic world, will have limited exposure to Macs. So from my point of view, I always believe that it's essential that you have a policy in place to deal with the situation where your examiner will come across a Mac. You may be lucky enough to have uh, a Mac person on your team who, who's always on hand to deal with a Mac, but they, they're not always going to be there. So you will need a policy and you will need training for the for these uh, for your team to tackle Macs. Um, the right equipment, of course, goes without saying. You need to factor in the fact that the fact that you will need different equipment, different cables, different software, and potentially different storage when you're dealing with a Mac as as a, a, an item to investigate. For me, though, one of the key things is you need to get experience of using a Mac because nothing beats actually understanding how to be a user of the device for when you're coming to deal with it, both at the scene of an investigation and then subsequently during your forensic investigation. So it's essential everyone is, is, is as best prepared as they can be and that they do have a policy in place that protects them and you potentially, maybe as their managers as well, so that they act within their legal requirements and local policies before they actually attempt to interact with the device. So what, what do we do at the scene? What are, what are the um, immediate considerations that we may have at the, at the scene? Well, pretty much the most important thing, as in all of these scenarios, is going to be the safety of the people that are going and carrying out these tasks. You need to have policies in place and with the best will in the world, we can't simply rush up to the device and start interacting with it. We need to think carefully about safety. We need to think about physical safety. Simple things like um, degrading power cords and things like that can be an issue. People have been hurt just diving around in, in the wires, etc., underneath the desk. I saw a case not so long before I left the police where razor blades were used on a lid of a laptop to protect it for someone who was unwittingly opening it without knowing where to open it safely. So once we've dealt with the safety issue, then the very next thing that I would be thinking about and worrying about is encryption, uh, simply because that device that may be open and exposed and available for us to exploit right now could, in the blink of an eye, become uh, locked. Um, and the device, with the di device locked out or perhaps uh, a loss of power or with, with a Mac, it could be about to go into sleep mode. Encryption could be an issue and we may have just lost our one and only opportunity to interact with this machine and get some good evidence from it. So I um, 
would encourage people to think about techniques such as deploying um, mouse jigglers, or I've heard other people refer to them as encryption denial devices. Just something that you can stick into the machine quickly to prevent it going to sleep. Now, of course, you need to think about, you may have written into your policy, there are risks with doing that as well. Um, the user of your machine may have set it in such a way that if that happens, the device actually automatically locks. So provided you're thinking about these things and you document your decisions um, and you act within those documented decisions, then I think that you'll, you'll be good to go to the next stage, which for me, would be to think about network co connectivity and the issues that arise from having a, a device that's connected to the internet. And I'm talking about there the possibility of remote locking or remote wiping of the device. Perhaps the person that you're dealing with has a colleague who's seen you as an investigator starting to mess with his machine and he has the password and the capability to remotely connect to that device and lock it out. Um, so we need to think about, once we've decided that we're ready to interact with this machine, are we going to make it secure by disconnecting it from the internet um, or network connectivity generally? Well, of course, this could be a good thing, but it could also be a bad thing because uh, we might be in a situation where a download is in progress. Um, and that might be something that we want to see go through to the end or it might be something that we want to stop immediately. Again, things to think about in that policy document that I keep going on about, and things that are, do warrant some, some serious consideration. If you look at the, the screen I've put up on uh, um, for you to look at right now, this is an example of a Mac screen. Uh, I think this is Yosemite, so uh, an operating system or two ago. But at some people, some of the examiners on your team may have never seen a Mac a desktop so it's important to educate them for them to have a look and get familiar with what it is they're seeing this one actually you may notice in the top uh, top uh, menu bar at the very top the first item is the menu bar I was going to talk to you about but I've just spotted I've realized my Dropbox is actually active on this screen so my at this exact moment I took the screenshot I'm doing some syncing with my Dropbox so that would be something to think about with your policy document. But at the very top we have a menu bar and on my desktop I have two mounted uh, devices. Uh, the first one on the right here is the Macintosh HD which is the standard name for the Macintosh volume on a, on a Mac at the moment and um, that in itself is a little bit unusual to see there because um, the default setting is for that to be hidden. So this particular user has perhaps chosen to have that displayed on his desktop, which uh, may may or may not give you some indication of the level of uh, competence or usage of the, of the person. It's uh, um, a good indication that this person perhaps knows a little bit more than the average user because he wants to go rummaging around in his file system rather than relying on the items that Finder presents to him. The next device that's mounted there is an external USB device called Untitled. And then this big arrow going into the middle of the desktop here is just to indicate this is a, Apple spent a lot of money on developing some really nice screen savers and uh, desktop backgrounds rather. And th this is sort of uh, one of the reasons they like to keep this clean and tidy. And I think sometimes certainly over in my limited experience of this, you, when you see a desktop that's clean like this, it potentially means that someone is a bit organized and understands how to use a Mac properly. Whereas uh, I've seen other users uh, whose desktop is absolutely piled high with icons because they really don't know where they want to save things. So it's little things like this that will give you an idea of the level of uh, capability of, of, of your user. So, Let's assume we've put our uh, mouse jiggler in. We're happy this device isn't going to go to sleep. So let's move to the next stage that I spoke about before, and this is to make this uh, safe from outside interference. So I'm looking at a, a slightly different view here now, and I can see that the active application here is iTunes, because that's what's listed in the menu bar. 
And now I can also see that on the right there, I have a normal uh, a sort of Wi-Fi logo indicating to me that this device is connected to something called Racers Network. Some of you will be familiar with that from some of our training courses as, as uh, the racer character features heavily in that. If I was to uh, select the Alt key, which is also known as the Option key, and there's a photo of it there for you now on the screen, this may give me some extended data uh, about the uh, attributes that we've clicked on. And this is actually a function uh, that's available in various other menus on a Mac. And in this case, you can see the slightly grayed out um, items are suddenly being revealed. And we can see now the local MAC address, and we can actually see the IP address and router information. So perhaps this would be a good time to uh, take a photograph of this. Um, there's some information there that might help me later with my investigation. And I may have now reached the point where I'm happy that I can disconnect this device from from the internet if it's Wi-Fi connected. The same thought process would take place if it was connected by wire, of course. So the next thing, next question is, so I've made this safe. It's not going to sleep. So what am I actually dealing with? What is the device I've got in front of me? And the way you'd go about having a look at this potentially would be to click on the Apple logo in the top left of the menu bar. And here you can see the very first entry there says about this Mac. And I would be tempted at this stage to have a uh, click on that about this Mac and take a look at the specifications. And here I can see that it is indeed Mojave which is Mac OS 10.14.6. And I can see that this machine has 16 gigabytes of RAM. So that's something for me to think about when I'm possibly considering imaging RAM. At least now I have some idea of, of ha how much storage space I'm gonna be needing. Although don't forget Mac RAM is, is quite heavily compressed and you should allow at least one and a half times the uh, given or displayed um, amount of RAM. Something else you might consider, and I wouldn't be running this on my suspects machine, of course, but on, on this example here on the screenshot I have for you there, you can see I've used Mac Tracker, which is a quite a good app. Of, or you can get that for your phone as, as well as having it on your Mac computer. And this will give you more information about the device that you're looking at. And this might be useful in determining your uh, approach going forward from here. So a couple more things to consider so that we have a better idea of what we're dealing with and whether or not this is likely to be a relevant and significant machine in our investigation. And I always start with the investigating the dock. And the dock is at the, the bottom of the screen in, in my case here, but it can be to the sides and of course it can be hidden. So Ordinarily, the dot underneath an application, uh, in the example you're looking at there, we see Chrome with a dot underneath of it. This indicates that the application is actually active at the moment. Now, don't forget, this, this is, again, like many of the uh, features on a Mac, this is a preference that the user can adjust, um, and it is possible to turn that off. So you might not see any dots underneath these applications. Uh, an indication of, um, of, of that having been switched off is if you were to look at the Finder app, which unfortunately is just off the edge of my uh, screenshot here, but just over to the left-hand side is Finder, so the sort of equivalent of Windows Explorer. This is always running on a Mac in, when the Mac is in a, a, a normal user state, such as the one we're looking at now. You'd expect to see a dot underneath Finder. So if there is no dot underneath Finder and there are no dots anywhere else underneath these applications, then that means or it's a strong indication that the user has switched off the dot being displayed underneath the applications. So I've also got a dot underneath the, uh, this is, um, oh, it's gone from me now, um, Keynotes from, from uh, Apple's version of PowerPoint. Uh, that's active. And then over here, I'm slightly more interested in the applications that are over this side of the dock. And this is simply because, generally speaking, 
applications that are at this end of the dock are normally the ones that the user has put there. It's not entirely true in my case, as you can see to the left on my dock, I have uh, Microsoft Word displayed and I have Microsoft Office. So I've moved those down to this end, but generally the default Mac applications will be here on the left-hand side of the dock. And then ones the user uh, has selected to put into the dock will appear down towards the right-hand side. So let's have a, let's make that a little bit bigger, maybe a little bit clearer so you can see it. There's some interesting things here. And um, of course, I would be very concerned if the person I was investigating had these two older versions of uh, black bag software running here, Blacklight and Mobilize are both running here. But more, more likely and more interesting would be potentially if I saw terminal running, this would be an indication that someone uh, may be quite uh, an experienced or um, uh, a, a knowledgeable user of a Mac because this person has decided to put the terminal into the dock as a shortcut. And they've done that along with disk utility, which is, um, it's, it's not as good as it used to be, but this is a great tool for formatting drives, making encrypted containers uh, and such like. So if that was saved by the user into the dock, again, it would demonstrate a level of uh, competency that would start to make me a little bit concerned that this person uh, is, knows what they're doing when they're using a Mac. So these are just clues, just putting me, just putting some information into my mind about what this person is using their machine for and how, how uh, competent a user they are. So once, once I've done my preliminary look and I'm ready to start interacting with this machine, I need to think about being forensic. Uh, we're about to make changes to this Mac by running Macquisition. And the word, if I can think back to some of my uh, legal law, legal training, the word forensic sort of means making ready for presenting to the court. So the reason we're doing this is we are, most jurisdictions operate the system of please don't make changes to original evidence. And this, of course, applies to fingerprint evidence and DNA evidence as much as digital evidence. But of course, the world has changed a lot uh, as far as digital evidence goes, and we do now need to interact with these machines. So when we do interact, we will be making changes. What we need to know is, or be aware of, is what changes are we making? Um, and how best can we document those, those changes so that when we are questioned in court, we can explain what we did and why we did it. Um, I'm going to show you a couple of examples, but um, in reality, if you want to really go to town on this, you need to come along to one of our um, uh, basic forensic investigator courses or our Apple forensic investigator courses, where we go into a lot of detail into some of these uh, items here. But this is quite a good example uh, for two reasons. One, it's an example of changes we're going to make. And two, it's an example that is sort of unique to um, a Mac rather than Windows in the way in which those changes are carried out. Here I'm looking in the menu bar, again I clicked on the Apple in the top left hand corner and recent items is down on the list here. If I look at my recent items, many, will, many of you will know or will have spotted that these are all alphabetical and this is actually very different to Windows uh, because Windows stores its um, recent items as in the first in first out rule that's very different with Mac on a Mac the recent items are not saved like that and in fact the uh, very last item run will not be at the top of this list because it will not work like that uh, whereas it will do on Windows uh, fortunately for forensics, in the background there is a plist that does record the order in which these applications are run. But at this stage, when I run Macquisition in a minute, I have no idea which one of these uh, current applications that are displayed here in, in this list of 20 will fall off. 
And this is uh, a setting that I've chosen. I have 20 items in this list and that's a user preference because the default is 10 and it can go from naught to 50. So I would be tempted to take a photograph of this because I'm gonna make changes to this machine and this list is actually never going to look the same again or potentially is never going to look the same again because the change I'm going to make is not reversible. Um, and by taking a photograph, I can actually show the uh, judicial process that I've been very thorough and I'm documenting the changes that I've made. So we plug our acquisition device in and you will see that uh, some volumes mount on the desktop. Now, the screenshot I'm showing you here will look different to the one Stephanie's going to show you in a minute when she does a live demonstration, because what you're seeing here is hidden volumes. So this user has chosen an option to show their hidden files and folders or volumes on their desktop. You wouldn't expect to see that many of the volumes because the ones that are hidden, slightly grayed out in the screenshot you can see, um, are actually our bootable volumes and they're not they don't come into play right now, they'll come into play when we start to look at booting our Mac acquisition, um, using our, uh, booting our Mac using our Mac acquisition dongle. So we would choose the application and we would, after we double click the application icon, we will be invited to enter the administrator password. If you have the administrator password, you're going to be running at elevated privileges levels. This is obviously what we want to do. So uh, this would be the time to enter that password. Once you go into the device, whether you're going in restricted or uh, with elevated permissions, you get a warning. You'll be told that there's full disk encryption has been detected. This needs to be treated with a, a little bit of caution because uh, to, to most of us, full disk encryption, you would imagine that the entirety of the hard drive is encrypted, the physical device is encrypted. That may not be the case because we may be running on a non-T2 chip Mac where there's no hardware encryption. And if we, for instance, had a Windows partition on our Mac, which is perfectly possible since Mac started um, using Intel chips, um, if we had a Windows partition, that would not be part of Apple's encryption uh, policy. So what we're talking about here really is full volume encryption. And Stephanie is going to talk to you about some of these when she does a live demonstration in a short while. But we have incredible flexibility within Macquisition to allow you to collect uh, and drill down into different specific system user uh, files or system files on their own and we'll cover those very shortly in in the demonstration and we'll look at the methods of exporting out and how we can do some um, hashing on the way out with the data i wanted to spend a couple of minutes on 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 uh, imaging mac memory um, this is i think becoming more and more important um, and i'm sure um, you guys, especially the ones in, involved in maybe law enforcement or even malware or those type of investigations, realize the importance of grabbing this RAM because uh, it, it can hold all sorts of secrets. And at the moment, maybe we're not um, reading or interpreting Mac RAM particularly brilliantly. When I say we, I'm talking about the forensic community generally. But that doesn't mean that there isn't something we're going to be doing really well in a week or two months' time. Um, and previously, I'm sure some of you would have seen the uh, examples of where we've been able to recover passwords from Mac RAM. Uh, FileVault passwords have been in there from time to time. So it's my opinion you should always try and grab this. If you have a significant investigation and you have the opportunity, let's grab Mac RAM. Um, so how would we go about doing that? Imagine that we hadn't been able to enter the administrator's password when we were running live. If that was the case, then we would not see the RAM. 
This is one of the system areas that we wouldn't see unless we had elevated permissions with Macquisition. So had we been running in restricted mode, what we would need to do to get hold of that RAN now is to do a restart with our Macquisition dongle ready to be booted up into. Because when we run Macquisition from the dongle, when we run one of the operating systems from the dongle, we will be running as administrator. So the way in which we do this is you select the apple in the top left-hand corner of the menu bar, and halfway down there, you'll see the restart option. So this is, uh, this is going to force a restart on the machine, and we're going to hold down the option key, and when it comes back to life, we will be able to choose um, a, a forensically sound operating system from our Macquisition dongle, and we'll be running as administrator. The, the beauty of doing this in this particular way is that the RAM itself, although there will be some significant changes in there, the RAM itself will remain live uh, and it will not be flushed. So um, there's been lots of testing on this and people are recovering huge percentages of, of that RAM. And the, the bigger the RAM, the more of the previous session data you're likely to recover. So in my opinion, this is always worth doing now if you have a significant investigation that, that justifies it. So at the same time, it's worth thinking about, uh, once you've gone through your logical options, what, are, what else is available to you and what is the benefit of doing a physical acquisition compared to logical? Well, you can see from my slide there that there, there are a number of uh, what could be significant um, items that you will not be pulling if you do just a logical uh, acquisition from, from your machine. So you won't get file slack, you will not get file, some of the file attributes, you will not get raw data shots, uh, raw data blocks, and of course, most importantly, you will not get all of the APFS snapshots. A logical acquisition uh, will not get you all of the APFS snapshots, and you could be missing many hundreds, if not thousands of files if you're just gonna rely on a logical acquisition. So those users of Macquisition out there will be familiar with this, uh, this, this screen. This is the startup manager. This is what you'd see when you boot into Macquisition under the control boot environment. Um, this, in this particular example, we're seeing a standard standard named Macintosh HD, which is the internal device of the computer that we're examining. And then we have the four uh, different versions of Macquisition's forensically sound bootable operating system environments. And these go back covering a long period of time now, as you can see, we've got the most recent one is uh, our 2019 versions of Macquisition. But then we go back to MQ secondary, legacy, and then all the way back to 2011 uh, bootable operating systems there. This will boot most of the Macs you're likely to see today. Um, and as I said to you before, I, I've yet to see a situation where we've been unable to help customers boot their Macs where it's been possible to do that. Once again, exactly the same warning will come up, uh, reminding us of this full disk encryption, which we now know we'll, we're really talking about full volume encryption. Um, let's have a look. So one of the th next things to consider is uh, when we're talking about booting to Macquisition, of course, with new Macs, most of you will know now that we have no external booting because there is secure boot enabled. Um, this, this is uh, a problem and you'll think, well, why are you talking to me about using Macquisition to boot uh, my, my Mac up with when it won't work? Well, it will work because you can actually turn this off. Um, and in order to turn it off, you will need to, at boot time, go into the recovery partition using command plus R. Uh, but of course, you will be needing the administrator's username and password. So this is why it's not something that I, I'll spend much time on, because we don't recommend this as the best way to uh, image a Mac currently from this uh, booting environment, because you're going to be making significant changes by going in this way, um, because you're going to have to change secure boot, and you're going to have to change external boot and allow booting from external media. 
And then once you've done that, you'll have to reboot the machine again. So uh, in a short while, I'll be talking to you about a, a method that I would recommend for dealing with uh, a Mac that you want to boot. Something else that you may want to, you, you might come across is, is a firmware password. If you hold the Alt, which is also known as the option key down, um, you can check and see if there's a firmware password. And this will prevent, if there is a firmware and password for, uh, it present, this will stop all other functions. Now, um, there's been some recent changes, I believe, from Apple, and they no longer support uh, law, law enforcement officers who go to their genius bar um, and ask them to help with a locked a firmware locked Mac. Um, so I believe at the moment you have to go down the normal MLAT or the uh, you have to have the appropriate legal authority in place to approach Apple to deal with this now. Um, but stay tuned for that because uh, if we have an update, I will let you know about that. So, so what are the other considerations? Well, many of you probably remember that uh, way back in 2015 now, Mac came out with this, uh, the 2015 12-inch Retina MacBook, which actually only had one hole in it. And of course, this, 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 this one hole was responsible for uh, the, the delivery of power and data exchange um, from, from a wire. So it's immediately starting to cause us problems because we need to use Macquisition, we need to have storage media, we need to get power into the Mac. And quite often, it wouldn't have been possible to image one of these without delivering power to the device at the, at the time. So this, the other issue here was, of course, the way in which storage is spread across these devices now has become extremely complex. And in this particular example, half of the storage was on one side of the, of the motherboard um, and the other half was on the other side. So it made taking a hard drive out of this device pretty much a non-starter unless you, you were into some very extreme electronics. Um, so we had a solution, a workaround using Macquisition where you would use a powered hub, um, a Macquisition dongle, um, your external storage, and of course, uh, you must use a genuine Apple um, converter, USB-C um, adapter. Uh, we did a, a lot of testing at Black Bag on, on um, different types of these, and we found that there were problems with them. Um, and sometimes this is resulting in the power, then losing power, and then your image failing halfway through, which is not very satisfactory. So I recommend that you do um, buy a genuine Apple adapter when you're considering this. But of course now, uh, today we have our new SSD acquisition, the one terabyte or the 120 gigabyte version, which comes with a USB-C uh, cable so that you can attach direct to the Mac as well. So let's take a look <clears throat> at some specifics. Let's look at the actual combinations that you might come across. This, this first one here, if we're looking to image an HFS Plus and Fusion Drive, we need to look at what Macquisition presents to us. So in this particular example, we can see we must have administrator privileges because we can see the physical memory. And in this particular case, we can see that disk zero is the physical hard drive. And disk one is the SSD side of our Fusion setup, where, whereas disk two is the Fusion volume. So in this particular case, the data that we're going to be interested in will be the logical volume which contains the, ver the merged data from the two physical disks. You also remember what I mentioned Boot Camp, and that's the Windows implementation or the, the, the Max implementation of Windows on their machine. If you need to get hold of the Windows partition, if there was one here, we recommend that you go back after you've acquired your, few, your uh, synthesized data and you take a physical disk image and then you'll also have your partition. Here's another scenario. This is an APFS Fusion Drive. Um, this came with 1014 um, from Apple. And Macquisition now with the 2019 R1 and above actually recognizes Fusion Drives, which is 
which is which is quite neat now and this is one of the main reasons that we can do this is because of our implementation of the open AFF4 imaging standard which allows us to image the um, merged synthesized data in a non-linear fashion and then present it as a file that you can then put into your forensic tool. Here's a, an example of an APFS computer that has not got a T2 chip inside. So in this particular case, you have a couple of options. You can select the physical disk or the APFS container. At this particular example, you will not need, at the time of acquisition, you will not necessarily need the user's password. But the one thing you must be very cautious about doing is don't be tempted to image one of the partitions from the container. Because although you know that's where the user data is going to reside, it will not be readable. Uh, and I've heard other people refer to the volumes within the container acting like a RAID. Um, and if you only take one part of that RAID, it means that you're not gonna be able to read the data on there. So it's, it's not a bad analogy. So Stephanie will talk you through some of our imaging options, but here you can see we do raw DMG and then various flavors of EO1, and you can segment those. Let's talk um, a little bit about uh, Max with a T2 security chip. And uh, these have been around now since 2017, and all 2018 and newer Max will have one of these in on board. Uh, there are a couple of exceptions to that, but generally speaking, most of us uh, are going to be seeing just the T2 chip max. And these provide a significant um, increase in security for Apple's customers who use these things. Um, I've heard other people explain that this is very similar technology to what we first saw when the um, way back when the iPhone 4S came out and all of a sudden that uh, concept where we were no, no longer able to see emails. I'm sure you remember that from, from the 4S and upwards on an iPhone. Well, this is what's going on here with this chip now. It's making forensics very, very tricky. Um, and the technology here I'm told is, 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 uh, is pretty sound. And at the moment, there's no opportunities to take software or firmware and go ahead and read the keys off this chip. If you try physically interfering this, with this chip and damage it, then you're very likely to um, uh, have lost all of your data on that hard drive because if that T2 chip isn't functioning properly, you will not be able to encrypt the data that's on that SSD. And of course, it's, the, it's this chip that actually prevents that booting from external devices as well. Quick summary of the overview of how this impacts on us as forensic people. Software encryption. So before we had T2 on the Mac, we were talking about software encryption. And one of the nice things about software encryption was you could image that device and then you could walk away safe in the knowledge that even though you had a whole load of encrypted data on there, there was still an opportunity that that, that, that was crackable because Everything that you need to get into that software encrypted uh, blob of data you have is, av is available to you on the disk. The only thing that's missing is the password. Well, that's completely different now with the hardware encryption from the T2 chip, because not only do you have all of the requirements for software encryption, you now have the hardware encryption. And what this in effect means is that the decryption of the data must take place at the time of acquisition. You can't go back later. There is no going back. You cannot take a physical uh, encrypted image from a T2 chip Mac um, and decrypt it outside of that Mac. Uh, you cannot go back to it later and try with that, with that image of the encrypted data because the keys revolve. So, the important thing to take away from my little chart here is that the decryption must happen at the time of acquisition. So, yes, mostly you are going to need the password. Uh, a T2 chip the system, the content is encrypted by default. Um, there are situations where the user may not have turned on the fire vault 
um, but you will need the password. You'll need the password to parse non-T2 chip file system uh, data in Blacklight. And at the end of the day, it's very unlikely, and I've yet to hear of anyone uh, turning off their um, uh, their file vault encryption because they think that the T2 chip does a, a sufficient job on its own. Uh, but, but of course, it doesn't do that because even if you turn the file vault off, you'd be able to view those files potentially without the password uh, because the T2 chip will do the decryption for you. Um, one of the a couple of interesting things here you need to know about is that the, the, the actual drives are raw storage and there is no PCI controller. So at the moment, uh, there are no known adapters for this type of proprietary SSD. You simply can't just pull the SSD out and take it onto a similar lap, you know, a laptop, even if it was a T2 chip, because the keys aren't going to match up. It has to be that hard drive talking to the T2 chip that laid down the data on that hard drive. It's not possible, uh, as far as I know, at the moment to do anything about that. So what types of acquisition can we get with, with T2? Well, we can get a physical encrypted uh, acquisition, and this is, this is what I was talking about being pretty much useless. Uh, there, there's gonna be nothing on there. You've, you've, you've imaged a physical uh, SSD and it has been hardware encrypted. You are unlikely to get anything off that at all. Uh, never say never, but I don't think you will be have any. You'll have no success. So what we're talking about is physical decryption. And uh, since 2019 R1 version of acquisition, you now have the ability to interface directly with the T2 chip, and you can decrypt that data at the time of acquisition into a physical decrypted image. The data itself will be collected as it logically exists on the dock. Uh, on the disk. Um, and the reason we can do this, very similar, we were talking about the fusion drives and the issues there, but we are having to go ahead and image in a non-linear fashion again. So the blocks aren't being imaged sequentially, and that's why we had to resort to the AFF4 image format. Of course, logical imaging is still available, um, and we'd, we've been doing logical imaging for a long time now, uh, but you will miss some of the file metadata. You will miss things like dataless snapshots. Um, so whenever possible, and I would always go for the physical decrypted image using Macquisition. So what do you need at the time of acquisition? Well, you can, you'll be going in at the, uh, using Macquisition 2019 R1 and above, and you could do that with a pre boot environment once you've turned off the uh, system integrity protection that we spoke about. Or you can be mounting the suspects machine into target disk mode um, and then taking another Mac as your forensic workstation. Um, provided you're running version 10, 14 and above, um, this will work a treat for you because what you'll be able to do is use Macquisition to interface with the suspect uh, Mac. And so you'll be able to get Macquisition to do the decryption at the time of acquisition using the suspect's own T2 chip. Uh, and in this way, you will recover all of those artifacts that you will not get with a logical acquisition. If FileVault's enabled, of course, you're going to need the recovery key or any user's password. That's the important word there, any. So uh, any user's password will help you at that point. Worth considering if you have a particularly stubborn suspect and there's a couple of uh, other users on there, this could help you. Um, you do have the ability to skip unallocated uh, um, space at this particular time. However, if like me, you're a little bit paranoid about this and you're aware that there are lots of people working on this. There may be some gains in this area in the future. So if you do have time and you want to, go ahead and grab the unallocated. Um, but you have the ability with Macquisition to uh, save a bit of time 
and space and just uh, uh, avoid that collecting that data at the time of acquisition. AFF4 is compressible um, and Macquisition at the moment creates a single segment AFF4 image uh, file. Um, we're looking hopefully uh, in the near future in, in changing that and you'll be able to segment it. Um, although segmentation I don't believe of course is not uh, it's not such an issue as it used to be um, when we used to have to save backup images on DVDs and things like that. Segmentation isn't quite the thing that it used to be. Okay, so once you go down the, T to the uh, target disk mode route and you've attached your Mac to the target disk mode Mac, you'll be presented with the messages here telling you once again that full disk encryption is, is, has been detected and that you can enter the user password um, or recovery key at this time. And <coughs> what you actually go ahead and image generally across the whole uh, Mac infrastructure now depends on a variety of things, but whether or not it is protected with FileVault 2 and or T2, T2 hardware encryption uh, is, is what's going to be your number one concern. Now, I don't plan to go through the whole of this somewhat confusing ch chart uh, in, in, a, in a minute or two, that'd be too much to take in. But just to let you know, this information is available in our Macquisition Quick Start Guide on, on our website. And this basically walks you through and talks to you about all of the different combinations, um, whether or not you have an HFS plus formatted drive and it's a fusion drive or a single drive. That type of thing is explained to you here in the Quick Start Guide. So um, that's available from our website. You don't even have to be a customer to get hold of that. So, um, we imaged to AFF4 for this particular type of um, image file that we're going through from, going for from our T2 APFS uh, machine. And as you can see there, you have the ability to do it in a compressed or non-compressed format and go um, have your image file hashed once you've collected the data. AFF4 is an open standard um, and it's been around a while. And it's now supported by most, or, or I say most, I say some popular forensic tools. Um, we've been talking to others and more are coming online with their support for this. It was not our intention to design something that was just for uh, use within Blacklight. So AFF4 gives you sparse or non-linear imaging, and that's what makes it so good with fusion drives and T2 chip devices. So Blacklight 2019 R3, many of you would have spotted. This was out was it yesterday or the day before. And this will fully parse anything that you've acquired using AFF4 um, with Macquisition. Uh, you, you won't notice any difference with your ingestion and processing of a, an AFF4 image. All of the file metadata will be revealed along with the snapshots, including those ones that logical imaging won't give you. Um, once added to Blacklight, of course, all of the usual processing um, functionality is available to you. All of the stuff such as image analyzer, um, actionable intelligence, everything will be available to you. And of course, the user password or recovery key won't be needed at the time because you would have done your decryptioning, uh, your decrypting at the time of acquisition. Okay, so. I'm sorry, that seemed to be an awful lot of information in a very short length of time. And I think, Julie, we have some questions or not? Yes, we've had a lot of great questions come in while you've been presenting. We've been able to answer some throughout um, directly, but we're going to ask a few live as well. Um, so first one, can acquisition image a bootcamp volume found on the hard drive? Yes, for sure. Yeah, that does get a bit confusing, doesn't it? Yes. Well, yes, Macquisition will image your boot camp drive. Um, and then once you've um, got the acquisition, the, the physical acquisition from that particular hard drive, you can you can put that into Blacklight. And of course, Blacklight will process uh, Windows uh, 
partition just as well as it processes Mac partitions these days. So yes, yep, no problems with that. Wonderful, thanks. And we'll ask one more now before Steph goes into her demonstration. Can you ask, uh, okay, so let's see. Um, can an examiner use a write blocker between Macs in target disk mode? Yes, that's, in, that's entirely possible. You can use uh, a write blocker, a physical write blocker. Um, however, uh, if you're running Macquisition on a live, uh, in a live situation on a live machine, your forensic machine, um, and you have SoftBlock installed, then of course you could use SoftBlock, which is our write blocking software for a Mac. Uh, but absolutely, yes, you can, and of course should, if you're at all worried about making any writes to your attached device, use hardware um, write blocking. And, and the question is a great one because something that is in target disk mode will be vulnerable to have writes made to it. So you do need to take protection. Great, thanks, Tim. Um, let's hand it over to Stephanie. Awesome, thanks, guys. Um, let's see, I think Tim's going to pass over the screen here in just a second. And I know we're getting close to the hour mark, so I will try to go through this very quickly. Um, Tim gave a lot of great information, so I won't uh, duplicate a lot of the stuff he said, but I can at least show it to you live so you can kind of see, see it in action. And I'm getting the screen now. Okay, so everybody should be able to see my desktop. And um, if you look on the right, uh, the right hand side of my desktop, you'll see the three volumes that Tim mentioned before. Those legacy ones are hidden on mine by default. So we just have application, MQ data, and the MQ license. Um, the MQ data, if you do have like the one terabyte dongle, for instance, is where you could save your acquisition to on the dongle itself. Um, but we're going to go into application. And you'll see here we have the app, the app um, as well as the quick start guide and the user guide. You probably don't want to open those on the suspect machine, but just know that they are there for reference if you need it. And I'm going to open the application. This is where we would put in the, the admin password. If I did not have the admin password, I could click cancel and I would have the option to run restricted. So what that will do is I can still do a live collection it will just be only with the permissions of that user that's logged in so i won't have admin rights i can't do like memory for instance but i could at least collect data of that local user that's logged in if i do run restricted in this case i do have the admin password so i'm going to click authorize and i'm going to put that in right now So now it's going to load up my acquisition and I should get the file vault uh, pop up that Tim mentioned. I'm going to go ahead and hit continue because it does tell me it's unlocked. And now we are in my acquisition. So it automatically takes you to the case info screen or case details screen. This is where you can put in information on your case. And um, also on the right hand side, you see. Um, like the system, the logs and reporting and the time zones. So if you need to change your time zone specific for your logs and your reporting, so instead of doing the current time zone that's selected by default, if you need to do it in Pacific time, for instance, um, you can adjust that here. Again, that will only update the time zone for your logs. So the next tab over is your data collection. This is your targeted logical collection. Uh, you, you see we already have a lot of stuff already pre-configured from system data, user files. Notice here I did log in as admin so I can see all the users. If I had to run restricted, I would only see the current user. Um, over here, a lot of things are checked by default. If I want to do control and click on one of these, I do have the option of deselecting or selecting all. I'm just gonna deselect all just so I can select some specific ones. Um, if you look over here, let's see, I'm gonna do all of like Stephanie, for instance. So now I'm, I'm gonna be selecting a lot of the information specific for the user Stephanie. And then I can select even 
more details as far as how much I want to collect for that particular user. Notice I highlighted this chat messages. Under the collection summary on the right hand side, I will see all the files that it's going to collect for chat messages. So in this case, it's quite a bit, but at least you have a record of what's being collected. You also have an idea of um, size. So you have right here the, the size of um, the data. I can't recall if, if Tim went over this or not, but um, some of the more recent um, operating systems, you have to allow full disk access for acquisition in order to see a lot of this user specific information. So I know when I first started user Mac using acquisition, I had all zero bytes over here, even though I knew there was data associated with that user. Um, so if you see that happening, and I think we have a blog post on this on our website, but make sure you have full disk access turned on for acquisition in order to be able to be able to collect this information. Um, over under collection summary, this is where you would set the destination of where you want your collection to go. You have your hashing. And then you have the option of, of saving it as a folder or a sparse image. We always recommend doing the sparse image because what that will do is it will containerize it. So if you have things like really long file paths that Windows doesn't see, tend to like very much, or if you're transferring your files from Mac to an NTFS partition for, or drive, for instance, um, you lose a lot of that Mac metadata if you have it in a folder. By doing a sparse image, you keep it containerized and you'll save all of that Mac metadata when you transfer it to another machine. So we recommend doing that sparse image whenever possible. And then the total collection size, depending on what I have selected over here. Down at the very bottom, if you if you need to collect information that is not showing up on this screen, you do have this additional files and you can hit select and point it to another directory that you would like to keep or to collect. I'm going to go over to image device. This is where we do your actual physical disk imaging. Um, you see here I have physical memory. I did provide the admin password, so I am able to see that and collect it. If I did not provide the admin password, you wouldn't even see this on here. So disk zero is my physical disk. Disk one it tells you it's my APFS container. It's a virtual container. Tim went over a lot of that information previously. If I had a T2 or a APFS Fusion, if I go to format, I would only see AFF4 under here. You would not see these other image formats. But in my case, since I just have a standard APFS uh, drive, I have raw, DMG, and then the various EO1 formats that we can save our image to. Again, you can segment if you need to, and then you can select certain hashes. And then down here under destination, you just hit the plus, size, plus sign and select where you want to save it. Again, if you do want to save it on your dongle, you have your MQ data right here that you can save it to, or you can save it to any other external device or internal device. Tools, we do provide some, um, a few tools that can help you in your acquisition. For instance, if you need to mount an external device, if you need to make a read-only device writable, you could do that within here. Erase device is a little misleading. This is actually, it's going to format. So if you have an external drive, for instance, that you need to format as HFS or NTFS, you can do that here. Again, you're probably doing this live on a target machine. So again, proceed with caution. <laughs> um, terminal, again, you're, this will be launching terminal as the root user. And then you have hash devising or hash devices and hash image files should you need to do that. And then these are very, we don't usually mess with these too much. Um, if you needed to refresh your device list, if you plug something new in, you could do that here. Um, status tracking is on by default. This is going to track pretty much everything you do within Macquisition. We recommend just leaving that on. It doesn't slow your performance down. If it does, it's very little. So we always recommend just keeping that on, but you do have the option to click on that and turn that off. 
So that is a very quick introduction of my acquisition. And I guess we will give it back to Julie. Great, thanks, Stephanie. So we did have a lot of great questions come in throughout the presentation, um, but we know that we went a little bit over the allotted time today. So we will reach out to you individually after the webinar and we can answer those and you can speak to us that way. So please make sure that after the webinar, you follow us on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, and LinkedIn, and subscribe to our blog where our experts post a lot more information. And if you're interested in learning even more about MacQ or any of our other products or services, you can email sales at blackbiketech.com. Thank you all again for the great questions, and we will reach out individually when this is over. Thank you all again, and thanks, Stephanie and Tim. Bye. Have a good one. Bye. Bye.